It's a great pleasure once again, in my case, uh, for the fourth time, to thank uh, Hans and Gulchin for their uh, very generous, magnificent hospitality, which makes this meeting, uh, well, certainly the most pleasant that I ever attend. Uh, well, uh, yesterday you heard about the three-week sinologist, and uh, today you're going to have the three-week uh, political philosopher, that is me. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, equality of opportunity. A characteristic of contemporary political thought and speech is the triumph of connotation over denotation. That is to say, uh, the feelings or emotions aroused by words have become more important, even much more important, than any uh, meaning by which they are tethered to the real world outside our minds, uh, or by their most obvious corollaries. And it's beyond my scope today to suggest a reason why this should be so, but I think it will be readily granted that if I am right, it is a development that cannot but hamper a clear thought. Of course, I recognize that this uh, uh, imprecision of language is a recurring problem in human history. It was millennia after all, uh, ago that Confucius suggested that the first necessary reform in an unhealthy polity was to call things by their proper names. Well, let's take the word equality. I do not think that many people in public life would dare to say that they were against equality, uh, bearing in mind, of course, that most people would accept it in its most uh, formal and juridical sense. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't dare to say that that is the only sense in which uh, they approve of it. They, mu uh, they must mean, uh, this must mean, that the word equality uh, now has a connotation so strong that it is dangerous to dissociate yourself from it or disavow it as a goal. A person who is in favour of equality is a good chap, a democrat, one of us, a friend of the people, whereas someone who is against it or not in favour of it is the opposite, a bad chap, an elitist, one of them, even an enemy of the people. But it is easy to demonstrate that equality cannot itself be desirable. For if equality were desirable in itself, it would not matter whether it were produced by a betterment or a worsening of conditions. And since I'm uh, a doctor, I'll give you a medical example. Well, medical journals these days are obsessed by inequality, literally obsessed. And it is an undoubted fact that within all societies, rich people are much healthier than poor. And most of the medical journals argue almost ad nauseam for a closure of the health gap, as they call it, between the richest and the poorest people. Well, in Britain, as in other countries, the richest decile of the population has an infant mortality, uh, half that of the poorest decile. That is to say, its infant mortality rate, the number of children per thousand live births who die in the first year of their lives, is three instead of six. When my father was born, incidentally, in, the, uh, in London, in his borough, uh, the infant mortality rate was 124. Well, let us suppose it were possible to reduce the infant mortality rate in both deciles by one, such that the infant mortality rates were now two and five respectively. This would represent a, an increase in inequality, a widening of the ratio of infant mortality in the two deciles, from two to 2.5. But it would surely be a very odd person who said that such a diminution in infant deaths was therefore undesirable because it increased social inequality. Just as it, I think it would be a very odd person who would suggest that it would be desirable in the name of equality uh, to bring up the uh, infant mortality rate in the richest decile. But an improvement all round is actually presented as a deterioration. 
at least from the point of view of social justice. Now, I'm all in favour of pessimism, and, uh, but let it at least be rational pessimism. Now, it might be argued that egalitarians no longer look so much at outcomes as at beginnings. In other words, not equality of outcome, but equality of opportunity within societies, if not between them. What modern politician would dare to say in public that he was opposed to equality of opportunity, or that he believed that the very idea was pernicious and actually harmful in its effects? In addition to all the difficulties that equality of outcome as a desideratum has, a society of no opportunity would, after all, be a society of equality of opportunity. This supposed desideratum has other difficulties of its own. It's a commonplace that people vary in their natural endowments. Uh, and it's just as well that this is so, because if everyone were Mozart, uh, no one would be Mozart. Not only do people vary uh, at birth in their genetic endowments, but they vary in their family, social, and cultural backgrounds. And there is little doubt that some such backgrounds are more propitious for accomplishment and worldly success than others. I would hesitate to mention anything so obvious, but it is something that those who believe in equality of opportunity uh, wish to shut their eyes to. If one was serious about equality of opportunity, one would be a totalitarian so far ago as to make North Korea seem like a libertarian paradise. Only clones could be born and no parent could have any influence on the upbringing of his or her child for fear of introducing inequality of opportunity. Every child would receive exactly the same tra treatment, preferably from machines. A society of equality of opportunity would be one in which no parent could express in words or in action a preference for his own child or procure advantages for him or her in case it should prejudice the chances of another child. Well, I leave it to you to decide whether a society in which parents held no particular brief for their own children as against all the other children in their society or perhaps even in the world would be an attractive one. Aldous Huxley's Brave New World would be a starting and not an end point. It is clear then that uh, equality of opportunity is very nearly the antithesis of opportunity, for opportunity implies the incalculable among other things. But for all practical purposes, at least for the moment, equality of opportunity is an impossible and even an inconceivable uh, goal. But just because it is impossible and inconceivable does not mean that the idea is without its practical effects. Here, let me say that almost any idea is unattainable because men are not uh, perfect or perfectible, and because all ideals are incomplete, human des desiderata being various and contradictory. If I say that I value politeness, for example, I am not claiming that on each and every occasion in my life I am myself polite. Moreover, a world in which every human act interaction were a polite one would be a very insipid world. Nevertheless, it remains true that I do value politeness. But worthy or unattainable ideals uh, that are real are calls to self-control and self-cultivation. If I truly value freedom of thought, for example, I must learn to tolerate the expression of thoughts that I detest or despise. This is an achievement rather than something that can be taken uh, as natural. Indeed, the opposite would be far more natural. Well, let us examine briefly the psychological consequences of equality of opportunity as an ideal. A friend of mine, a, a Russian who emigrated first to the United States and then moved to England, told me that in the party, at parties in the United States, he would always introduce himself by name and then say, I hate my parents, don't you? <laughs> And he said that he never met anybody uh, who said no. Actually, I honor my mother and my father. Uh, this, uh, at the least, this showed that uh, 
this little experiment showed that resentment is a very common and easily aroused emotion. The status of victim is one that is now always, almost universally uh, claimed. Uh, and a man who claims to have gone through life like a hot knife through butter is not highly regarded or widely admired. In fact, resentment is one of the very few emotions that will never let you down or can disappoint. Uh, really, the only one that I can think of is uh, righteous indignation. But righteous indignation uh, is, uh, though it can be quite long-lasting, it's seldom lifelong and has to find new objects uh, to, to be uh, indignant about. Resentment, unlike uh, righteous indignation, uh, does not need to change its focus and can be fixated early and can last, and often does last, until the deathbed. Now, the connection between equality of opportunity and resentment is obvious. There are very few of us who could or would claim that his upbringing or experience in life was so optimal that he not, had nothing to envy anyone else in the world for. Surely everyone knows someone else who, in one respect or other, had opportunities that he did not have, and this through no fault of his own. In other words, we all have grounds for resentment. There is always someone more fortunate than we. As I have said, uh, resentment can, and indeed often does, last a lifetime. And this is because it has certain sour satisfactions. Among these is the satisfaction of being morally superior to the world while remaining, objectively speaking, in a grossly subordinate, inferior, or undesirable uh, position. Uh, resentment satisfactorily explains all one's own failures and failings. I would have been, respect I would have been a success in some respect or other uh, if only I had the same opportunities as someone else. And here you need only to fill in the name or the person who was more fortunately placed uh, than you uh, to succeed in arousing your own resentment. Well, resentment is, of course, a universal human emotion. It's a permanent possibility for all of us, and it takes an effort to control it. Uh, is there anyone in this um, audience who uh, has never felt resentment. Can you put up your hand? I resent that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very rare. I think uh, I would say that the person who, to whom resentment is unknown is almost as rare as the person who has never felt pain. People who don't feel pain don't live very long, incidentally. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, resentful, though very nearly universal, uh, at least uh, potentially so, is not only a useless uh, but a harmful emotion. For it encourages him who feels it to dwell not on what he can do, uh, that is to say on his opportunities, but on what he cannot do, that is to say his lack of opportunities. From the moment of one's birth, there are many things that one is destined not to become. How easy, and I should say, how pleasurable it is to blame others for this fact, while vegetating in a super ministrone of, of self-pity. And when I used to uh, propose to my patients some, what seemed to me fairly simple and practical, solution to their problem, which might an existential one, they would say, quick as a flash, it's all right for you to speak, you've got a good job. And if I asked, how did I get a good job, uh, without so much as a moment's reflection, they didn't have to think about it, they said, you're born in the right place. So first, one is born with a silver spoon in one's mouth, and 24 years later, more or less, one starts practicing medicine. And, of course, the idea of opportunity encourages people and the lack of equality, the obvious lack of equality,
equality of opportunity, encourages people to suppose that anyone who is doing well, has done well, must ex officio, as it were, have been in receipt of greater and therefore illicit privileges. And secondly, that anyone who does not receive these uh, privileges is destined to a hopeless uh, situation. And here I'm not talking about logic, really. I'm talking about the psychology of it. Here, let me read a famous letter by the writer Anton Chekhov, who, as it happens, was a doctor, uh, who was then aged 25. And this is a letter to his publisher, A. S. Suvorin. Write a story about a young man, the son of a serf, a former shopminder, chorister, schoolboy, student, who was brought up to fawn upon rank, to kiss priests' hands, and to worship other, others' thoughts, thankful for every morsel of bread, often whipped, going to his lessons without galoshes, who fought tortured animals and loved dining out with rich relations, played the hypocrite before God and man through no necessity, but from a sheer awareness of his own insignificance. Write how this young man squeezes the slave out of him drop by drop, and then wakes up one fine morning to discover that in his veins flows not the blood of a slave, but of a real human being. Well, such a realization may, of course, never happen, and indeed often never does happen, because responsibility for one's own fate is not an easy path uh, to tread. And in this letter, letter, Chekhov, who actually led the life he describes as a child, uh, gives many potential rationalizations for a life of indolence, despair, resort to drink, etc., which was the life that two of his brothers actually did lead. I hope it, be, it will be clear, therefore, why a fixation on equality of opportunity, at least in situations where there are no formal legal obstacles to people's self-advancement or development, is disastrous. And why, if it becomes sufficiently general, it is bad for the whole of society too, and not just for individuals. But you might ask, if equality of opportunity is an intellectually frivolous idea, as I believe it to be, or ideal, one that is impossible of achievement, and yet which has a potential disastrous effect upon many people's psyche. And through that effect on the psyche, if you like, of the whole of society itself, why has it become an almost unassailable goal that no politician in the Western world would dare deny? After all, the objections to it are not so very difficult to see or work out. I mean, I can see them. Indeed, one might say that they are rather obvious. The answer, I think, is to be found in the use to which such an idea or ideal can be put. I'm not suggesting that there is any central plot or conspiracy, although, of course, I'd like to. Um, only that there is a coincidence of interests. And that it is a human universal characteristic, or at least potential characteristic, that people are able, by means of rationalizations, to align their ideas and their ideals on the one hand with their personal interests in the, on the other. And I'm not here making a Marxist epistemological point. I'm not saying that logically it must be so, uh, only that as a, psycho a matter of psychological and sociological fact. It often is so. And it, it is, in my belief, so in this case. Let us try for a moment a little thought experiment. Let us suppose that one wanted, for whatever reason, to erect or create a society in which a bureaucratic government arrogated itself ever more power to regulate and control the population. But to do so without the more obvious accoutrements of tyranny, Indeed, to do so with the consent and even at the request of the population itself. The espousal of what kind of ideal would be propitious to the erection or creation of such a society? I trust it will be obvious by now that equality of opportunity is precisely such an ideal. The very impossibility of it 
The very fact that it is a mirage that recedes as one tries to approach it, as it shimmers in the distance, is an advantage, not a disadvantage. For the failure to attain the goal justifies ever greater and more vigorous attempts uh, to reach it. Moreover, it is clear that the nature of the goal itself justifies interference in the lives of the citizens down to the very last detail. For there is literally nothing that anyone can do in the bosom of his own family or indeed in other places that does not affect the life chances of children or of people's other children all around him. And the greater the failure of each successive politico-bureaucratic interference, the greater the locus standi for yet further interference. This is a world in which nothing succeeds like failure. The beauty of the system is that with each failure, resentment in the population grows, or is at least maintained. As we have seen, the resentful person sees himself not as an agent, but as a passive victim of circumstance. And a victim of circumstance demands that the circumstance should be changed. He cannot do this himself. He has to demand that someone else does it for him. And since that someone else can hardly be individual, for all individuals who uh, want to change the circumstances are in the same boat as he, a powerful organization must do it for him. That organization, of course, can only be a powerful political bureaucracy that supposedly acts in the defense of the interests of the humble and humiliated. Well, I don't know what uh, such bureaucracies do in other countries, but I know in mine they humble and humiliate the humiliated and the humble, who nevertheless, because of their resentment at the absence of equality of opportunity, continue to look to it for their salvation. It hasn't gone far enough. They look to their oppressors for relief of their own oppression. And so uh, we spend billions nowadays, I suppose we need to say trillions if we want to be taken seriously, on that salvation. But that salvation never comes. It is, in a way, a rather beautiful scheme, as near to a perpetual motion machine as anyone has yet invented. The laws of thermodynamics, it seems, do not apply in politics. It might be asked what, if anything, uh, can be done about this, or indeed if anything should be done about it. After all, it seems that the dominated and those who dominate them share the same interests, that is to say, to keep the whole uh, machine in motion. But there are two problems. First, the perpetual motion machine is not really perpetual, at least in the economic sphere, that might be in the psychological one. And secondly, though resentment, as I said, has its sour satisfactions, uh, a, a resentful existence is not really a happy one, and indeed is one that is liable to outbreaks of irrational rage and brutality. Well, that perhaps disposes of the question of whether anything ought to be done, uh, but it does not answer the question of whether anything can be done. Nothing can be necessary that is not possible. And if, as I say, resentment springs eternal in the human breast, can it be expunged? Well, there's no final victory against it any more than there is an end to history. The cardinal vices, among which envy, which is not a million miles from resentment, is one, are cardinal not only because they are important, but because they are permanent features or temptations of human existence. <coughs> No one uh, believes, for example, at least I take it that no one believes, that the folly of speculative greed now having been exposed, it will never happen again. And if you can believe that, you could believe anything. Well, if I'm right, and it is mind-forged manacles that encumber a lot of mankind and imprison them, particularly in our societies, Though, though we designate ourselves as free, then argument and changing minds and changing conceptions is very important. We should not, insofar as it is in our power, 
allow our political and cultural elites to peddle unchallenged the idea of equality of opportunity, as if it were in the same category as mother love, something that is beautiful and warm and reassuring, and nothing that no decent or perhaps even sane person could very well oppose, and that by definition can have no harmful consequences. Well, this work will be long and arduous. Any victory will soon be followed by defeat, just as in current circumstances any attempt to reduce government deficits will soon be followed by equal and opposite attempts to increase them. But that is life, uh, human life, ladies and gentlemen. Two steps forward, one step back. Or is it the other way around? Thank you very much.